I was gonna do a video about Star Wars because it seems like media analysis is all the rage nowadays. I mean, this month has been really rough for a lot of us, so it would have been nice to take a break from this bleak reality we're living in today. And plus, as usual, the main video I'm working on is going to take way more research. But then I look at the contract I signed with Satan and it says I can't do media analysis for some reason, so what the hell. Here's a short-ish video about fascism. Anyways, we're in trouble. Right now, we are in the middle of manufacturing over capacity and capital over accumulation, where on the one side, companies are producing so much stuff that fewer and fewer people are buying their goods because the market is so saturated and nobody can buy shit because they're underpaid. And on the other, record-breaking profits keep accumulating without much of it being reinvested into the productive sector of the economy, like building new factories or expanding production. And instead, profits are being pumped into unproductive and risky investment vehicles, like real estate and arcane financial instruments. This kind of capitalist crisis has happened in the past, of course. In the 1930s, this led to the rise of 20th century fascism in Europe, but in America, it led to Fordism Keynesian compromise, wherein labor unions were elevated to power and social democratic policies were enacted. And after World War II, Europe adopted these policies too. After a period of economic growth and prosperity, the next capitalist crisis happened in the 1970s. This time, though, the response was to destroy labor unions and open up the floodgates of capital to the international market, so that accumulation and profit could keep expanding through the exploitation of the global south. And so, neoliberalism was born. After that, transnational corporations became the main economic and political force in the world. They were able to break free from the constraints imposed by individual countries, and were even able to remove them completely in some cases, like in developing countries. Stuff like labor laws and environmental regulation were easily bypassed by just moving production somewhere else, or even better, by threatening to move production somewhere else without actually doing it. Labor costs also became a non-issue, since again, they can move or threaten to move somewhere else if the labor of one country is unfavorable for business. Essentially, corporations have been allowed to do whatever the hell they want in the name of profit. I mean, they have been able to accrue so much capital, resources, and power that they're now the dominant force of the modern world. Governments and institutions now bend over backwards to cater to this new class of transnational capitalist class, hoping to get some crumbs off of their plates. Transnational corporations, in turn, continually exploit that and keep on expanding all over the world in search of accumulation. And that globalization has resulted in an extremely polarized world, where 1% of the population controls over half of the world's total wealth and the top 20% controls 94%, while the rest have to contend with accelerating impoverishment and dispossession. This extreme concentration of wealth means capital cannot find productive outlets to unload enormous amounts of surplus it has accumulated. And as the accumulation grows and grows, capitalists are pressuring states to create new avenues for profit making, and the neoliberal states are responding in several ways. First, they pump that accumulated capital into debts, both public and private, to create debt-driven growth. US household debts are now higher than they were before the 2008 economic crisis, and it's still going up. Actually, people in developed countries in general have been taking out more and more debts, as shown by the household debt-to-income ratio. Governments have also been taking out loans left and right, which brings us to… Second, they get governments all over the world to implement austerity and privatization, which are essentially ways to open new markets for capital to invest their money in. For example, due to an aging population, healthcare is becoming a big business, so privatizing it would open a new market for capitalists to invest in. They have done this in two ways. In developed countries, politicians are bought and made to keep inflating the state's deficit through military spending, tax cuts for the rich, and subsidizing big businesses. These actions then become the pretext for privatization and austerity. For developing countries, the IMF does the job by forcing structural adjustment programs, which entail austerity and privatization. Incidentally, these structural adjustment programs have wreaked havoc on the global south's economy, creating migrants fleeing economic devastation. Third, they deregulate the financial market, allowing for financial speculations to ramp up significantly. With deregulation, financial capital can now go hog wild and bet on whatever the fuck they want. Hell, you can make a bet on other bets, then bet on that first bet, and so on and so on. It's fucking wild. Of course, there's no real value being made here, it's all imaginary. And yet, some estimates value the speculative market at, and get ready for this because it's just mind boggling. Are you ready? It's valued at 1.2 quadrillion dollars, not billion or trillion, quadrillion. As a scale, the value of all goods and services produced worldwide in 2017 is 75 trillion dollars. You would need to get 1 million billionaires to get to 1 quadrillion. This financial speculation also drives up the price of real estate, making it much more expensive for people to live in this world. See, even though it has been proven wrong time and time again, people still see real estate as a stable investment. And since there are not many other alternatives for investment, capital will naturally flow into this sector, increasing the demand and jacking up their prices. This is why you have more empty houses than homeless people and one of the reasons why your rent is really high. 
Fourth, and the most important I think, is that they're funneling an ungodly amount of money into the tech sector. While it is driving economic growth, it's really nothing more than rent on the economy, because if you boil it down, a significant chunk of the tech sector is nothing but intermediaries between enterprises and consumers, which essentially means they're just skimming profit off of other productive sectors. I mean, really, what do companies like Facebook, Amazon, and Uber really do? Well, they get between you and businesses, and charge a fee for intermediating the transaction. Again, it's essentially rent. The other side of the tech sector isn't that much better either. Most of them exist to cut costs, especially labor costs. Companies like Google are racing towards automation, and their goal is to replace workers with AI. This digitalization of the economy is intensifying and accelerating the capitalist crisis, because now capital requires even fewer and fewer people. And those who are not needed anymore are thrown out of the system and made to live in the fringes of the society while accumulation continues. This is what they mean when they're talking about the surplus population. And incidentally, a large surplus population also drives down everyone's wages across the world, including yours. The tech sector has also reshaped the way we interact with the world. We're flooded with so much information that it's genuinely hard to tell the difference between truth and lies. It's being made worse by tech companies' ideology, which worships the free market and fetishizes free speech. Disinformation, misinformation, and conspiracy theories run rampant without any meaningful countervailing force to oppose them. And in some instances, these have even spread to the mainstream media. And technology has become an omnipresent element in our lives, not only through social interactions, but also through warfare, surveillance, repression, and social control. Everywhere around the globe, technology has made the military and police much more efficient at repressing the populace and secure resources. I mean, that's what they are for in a capitalist world. That's why when there's any resistance to the expansion of capital, the military and the police are there to crush it. And the truth is, the global capitalist system depends on these wars and repressions. But here's the thing, the victims of these campaigns of repression and wars are mostly from marginalized groups, religious minorities, immigrants, refugees, people of color, and LGBTQ plus people. And when this marginalized group fight back, when they mount a rebellion, they're being painted as the enemy, as an other. Hell, even if they don't fight back, they're still scapegoated as the source of all of the problems I've mentioned thus far. Isn't that weird? Where does that scapegoating come from? Well, this is where fascism comes in. See, fascism is, has been, and will always be, a particular reaction to capitalist crises. It is a far-right response to the havoc capitalism has brought upon the world, a symptom of a much larger crisis, if you will. All of these problems I've mentioned so far have converged and resulted in the rise of fascism in the 21st century. It manifested itself as right-wing populist movements, ostensibly led by petite bourgeois with the working class as the base. But here's the thing, the movements don't incorporate all of the working class, only some parts of it. Quoting William Robinson's paper on 21st century fascism, which is the main source of this video, 21st century fascist projects seek to organize a mass base among historically privileged sectors of the global working class, such as white workers in the global north and urban middle layers in the global south, that are experiencing heightened insecurity and the specter of downward mobility and socioeconomic destabilization. The anxiety and fear felt by these people are very much real. It might be partially irrational and unjustified, considering they're not the people who are facing the worst effects of capitalism, but the feelings are real, and people don't turn into raving, racist, nationalistic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, anti-Semite for no reason. The truth is, transnational capitalism has destabilized their lives, threatening their position in society. And so, these fascist and far-right movements are promising the privileged working class and the petite bourgeoisie stability, security, and the reversal of downward mobility by displacing the anger and anxiety that they feel and channel them to scapegoated communities, like Palestinians in Israel, indigenous people and people of color in Brazil, religious minorities and lower castes in India, immigrants in Europe and America, Muslims in Europe and America, refugees in Europe and America, black people in Europe and America, and trans people in Europe and America. Damn, Europe and America, get your shit together. Essentially, the fascists are saying that if scapegoated communities are removed, deported, or exterminated, the nation, however it is defined, will somehow find itself in a new golden era of prosperity, security, and stability. Or, if that golden era is perceived to be unachievable, then these actions are reframed as an act of revenge for closing that possibility. They've been able to shift the discourse and center it more and more on xenophobia, race or cultural supremacy, an idealized and mythical past, a militaristic and masculinist culture that normalizes and glamorizes conflict, social violence and domination, and contempt towards the most vulnerable. Notice that most of these are reactions toward being perceived as weak. And again, it kind of makes sense, right? Not the content, of course, they're all either lies, false, or irrational. But looking at it as reactions to a destabilizing world, where security is not guaranteed, fascism can be seen as an attempt to restabilize society by bringing back mythologized status quo. This pursuit for stability then creates a need to invent a justifying narrative that requires strength at the very center of it. And strength, obviously, is the opposite of weak. Usually, shit like these were contained in the fringes of the population, but more and more, we're seeing them seeping into the mainstream media. 
I mean, they don't broadcast the worst stuff like Holocaust denialism or white supremacist manifestos, but the mainstream media has platform fascist and repeated veiled fasci talking points. I think this is being driven by two factors. First, information flow has been largely decentralized through the internet. Now anyone and everyone can be a content creator, even me. On the one side, it has democratized knowledge, meaning that damn near everybody can contribute to the knowledge base of humanity, but whether the information is true, false, or in between is hard to check. On the other side, the internet has made knowledge infinitely more accessible to everyone, but again, validating the information as true, false, or in between is almost impossible to do quickly before it spreads like a wildfire. Combined, these two sides of the same coin have allowed for the exponential propagation of conspiracy theories, disinformation, and misinformation that bolster fascist narrative. And this leads us to the second factor. The previously hegemonic capitalist media has largely been unable to counter this reframing because a lot of people just don't trust them anymore due to their association with transnational capitalists, especially since alternative sources of information are infinitely more accessible. The problem is, in trying to get back that trust, the media then foolishly went with the flow and do the whole both sides thing, which inadvertently helped the fascists reframe the discourse and is justified by the media in the name of diversity and tolerance, you know, centrism stuff. Matter of fact, I would argue this is why the anger and anxieties are driving a lot of people to the right instead of the left. The language of tolerance and diversity has been co-opted by the transnational capitalist class as ways to market products and perpetuate capitalism itself. And due to this association, is it surprising that the backlash against transnational capitalism would manifest itself as the resistance against tolerance and diversity? I mean, most of the time, the far right frames diversity and tolerance as something that are forced by the international elites, a dog whistle for anti-Semitism. But it doesn't actually make sense, right? Why not be diverse and include everyone if strength is your main goal? After all, more people means more strong people means more strength. I mean, it's not that simple, but you get what I'm saying, right? And actually, I think there's another reason why anger and anxieties are driving people to the right. Simply put, there haven't been bona fide leftist alternatives since forever. Sure, today we have small and diverse but growing movement, but just 10 years ago, calling yourself a communist or a socialist would get you laughed out of the room and no one will take you seriously. Any leftist potential that existed was utterly destroyed by the time neoliberalism became the dominant system in the 90s. With anti-left propaganda normalized and labor movements dismantled, the right-wing potential was left completely intact and ready to pounce whenever a capitalist crisis fucks shit up, which is like right now. So without a strong leftist social infrastructure, it's really not that surprising that people would go to the right instead. The left is growing though, so that's, you know, pretty good. I mean, it's fractured, but at least it exists. But here's the thing though, the fact that politics is so polarized is telling us something. Simply put, the previous ideological hegemony, namely neoliberalism, is crumbling down and losing its legitimacy to rule. See, when a ruling class governs a country, or the world for that matter, it has to secure the social base and develop diverse mechanisms to legitimize itself by a combination of material rewards and violent exclusions of groups unnecessary, unwilling, or unable to be incorporated. The ruling class then can govern only when they're able to create alliances with other groups and convince the subordinate classes that its interests line up with their general interests. And the transnational ruling class has been failing to do that. It has become clear to everybody that their general interests, namely corporate profits and accumulation, are at odds with everyone else's. The violent exclusion of the surplus population is now their main method of control, and it has become clear that more and more people fall into this category, while the ruling class and their allied groups are getting smaller and smaller. This is reflected by the extreme level of income inequality, and people are not stupid. They see this and intuitively know they're being screwed. The failure of the neoliberals has allowed for the meteoric ascendance of the nationalists. The problem, of course, is that these nationalists are still transnationalists, but with fascist rhetoric approximating nationalism. They're essentially thinly veiled transnational capitalists masquerading as nationalists. I mean, sure, Trump can say whatever the hell he wants about immigrants and refugees, but he can't fight the globalized market looking for more and more accumulation. I think this is the main difference between 20th century fascist movements and the 21st century ones. To quote Robinson again, fascism in the 20th century involved a fusion of reactionary political power with national capital. It was, in part, the inability of German and Italian national capital to outcompete the national capitals of other European powers that led to a fascist response in the 1930s, once the crisis hit full force. In distinction, 21st century fascism involved a fusion of transnational capital with reactionary and repressive political power, an expression of the dictatorship of transnational capital. But here's the thing, 20th century fascism actually materially benefited some of the domestic working class and national capitalists at the cost of genocide and murder. 21st century fascism, on the other hand, doesn't really materially benefit the working class base supporting it, at least not better than what neoliberalism has to offer. So why choose fascism at all? 
Well, Robinson argues it's all psychological. The ideology of the 21st century fascism rests on irrationality, a promise to deliver security and resource stability that is emotive, not rational. It is a project that does not and need not distinguish between the truth and the lie. The Trump's regime public discourse of populism and nationalism, for example, bears no relation to its actual policies. In its first year, Trumponomics involved deregulation, the virtual smashing of regulatory state, slashing social spending, dismantling what remained of the welfare state, privatization, tax breaks to corporations and the rich, and an expansion of state subsidies to capital. In short, neoliberalism on steroids. Now, while the Nazis destroyed socialist and communist movements and trade unions, which was kinda like neoliberalism, they were done to allow for more accumulation for the local capitalists so they can compete with other countries. Capital wasn't allowed to flow freely between countries. Trump, on the other hand, opened new opportunities for transnational capitalists to profit off of American labor. I mean, look at Brexit. It's not solely a fascist or a far-right project, but there is a big contradiction akin to what I'm talking about here. Now, I know there are arguments for Brexit from the left, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the kind of Brexit supported by the fascists. It's ostensibly motivated, at least from the right, to limit the freedom of movement of immigrants to the UK. Yet at the same time, it will allow for the privatization of the NHS by the hands of transnational capital. It's embodying both xenophobic nationalism and capitalistic transnationalism. To quote Robinson one last time, 21st century fascism cannot be understood as nation-state project in this age of global capitalism. This is important because much recent discussion on neo-fascism frames it in just such terms and emphasizes nationalism as an imminent feature of fascism. Yet as I have emphasized above, and in contradistinction to the 20th century fascism, the current nationalist discourse among far-right groups is entirely political ideological, insofar as the programmatic content of far-right forces such as Trumpism is decidedly not national but global. I mean, if you look at it from this perspective, it's no wonder that conspiracy theories, disinformation, and misinformation can spread like wildfire. Believing contradictory nationalist and transnationalist ideas require one to actively maintain cognitive dissonance. The truth doesn't matter here because what's being sold are feelings, the feelings of security and stability. I mean, yeah, it matters that tech companies are allowing fake news to propagate freely, but they're a mere conduit for something people actually crave, the feelings themselves. I mean, if there's supply, then there's demand. So where does this leave us? Well, neoliberalism hasn't completely fallen out of favor yet. There are people, mostly centrist liberals, who still believe the system can work, even against mounting evidence that says otherwise. I mean, to be honest, I truly think they believe it because it has benefited them greatly, but that's neither here nor there. What I think is important is the fact that those centrists are losing ground as more and more people are being thrown out into the fringes of the society, becoming surplus population that capital has no use for. This has actually manifested itself less in mass unemployment and more in mass underemployment. As underemployment grows, so does discontent. As I said in the beginning, we're in the middle of overcapacity right now, but it's being obscured by a growing mountain of debt driven by overaccumulation. At some point, all of those debts will have to be paid back and create an economic downturn, so even more people will be underemployed, anxious, and pissed off. So maybe, just maybe, we need to get ahead of this and prevent people from going to the right when it happens. Maybe we need to rebuild the social infrastructure that was decimated by 40 years of neoliberal rule. Maybe we gotta learn how to listen to people and see what they actually need. Maybe we gotta figure out why the left is losing elections and analyze it honestly. Or if we can't, then I might just Pokemon go fuck it all and live in the forest. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, go click that like button, it really helps. And um, if you haven't yet, go subscribe. It also really helps, so you know, it'd be cool if you do it. You don't have to, but it'll be cool, but whatever. Uh, what else? Oh yeah, the next video is going to be about technology and the um, ecologically unequal exchange between the global south and the global north, which is, I think it's really interesting. I think it's going to be fun. Um, what else? You know what's funny? Like this video was supposed to be like 10 to 15 minutes long, but it just kind of blew up. Uh, what else? Yeah, that's about it, I think. Um, yeah, see you next time.